Greetings from the third dimension. You're listening to the Paranormal UK Radio Network, the biggest UK paranormal network. I'm David Young, and this is Paranormal Dimensions. Well, here we are again, and as I said last week, we've got Michael Feely back again, because uh, it was so fascinating last week, and I think it was just... I think it was just being un- a bit unfair to Michael to uh, cut into two, actually. Uh, oh, sorry, I just had one part because I think there's so many more, um, so much more to his story and his his research. So I think I'll introduce Michael Feely back again, and hopefully he'll be able to continue from where he left off. <laughs> Hello, Michael. Hello again, David. Thanks, thanks for uh, inviting me back. No, no, it's a great pleasure. It's been, I've been absolutely fascinated. Um, it's, it's given me a lot more. Uh, I need to be doing a lot more reading about this stuff because it's uh, <laughs> it's actually blurring my mind quite a bit. <laughs> but, uh, well, that, that, that's good. It's uh, it's obviously worth. I think now. we were talking about <laughs> some uh, ley lines and things like last last week, and uh, the, how one thing leads into another, and uh, it was just fascinating to me. Um, if you can remember where we, whereabouts we were up to, um, I'll leave it to you. Well, yeah, I'd, yeah, absolutely. I was, I was just saying that uh, oh, because I found a, a, a blueprint that, that that I call an ancient code, uh, and because I found that blueprint in, in in all of the ancient past, and I just mentioned whether it's the pyramids of Egypt, the pyramids of the Mayans, the Quetzalcoatl of South America, whether it's in public buildings, whether it's in uh, government buildings, whether it's in the Bible or Islam or all of these holy books, whether it's in s- circular monoliths in, in Wiltshire, whether it's monoliths around the world, whether it's myth and legends such as Atlantis and Lemuria, whether it's cuneiform uh, scrolls such as the Sumerian scrolls, there is a message that has been encrypted, that has been left for humanity to find and i think that that message is given to us by higher than human consciousness and when you start looking at how fascinating and how well encrypted and how brilliantly it's been encrypted but how it how it was used to amplify enhance how stonehenge was was, was used as a sort of a phonetic profiler which is basically capable of deciphering messages within sound waves. Mm. Now, what, what they were doing, if, 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 if everyone understands about the World War II Enigma code breaking machine, you will understand that you are able to extract words and letters from sound through the likes of radio waves. Now, when, now a normal radio wave is a singular sine wave. If you wish to encode messages inside that, you create two radio waves together. That then encrypts a message. And if you want that message to be of a higher octave, of a higher frequency, those two waves are put very, very close together. Now, when you look at the, the likes of, of the, the great composers, such as Bach and Mozart, Bach in particular used to put coded messages in his symphonies and he actually used to communicate with his wife and members of the family by encoding messages within within the sounds of his symphonies. Really? So yeah. when you start looking at the likes of Stonehenge, which is really a, a gigantic tuning fork, and you start being able to scribe and, and transcribe and extract these words and letters out of sound, you can then start to communicate through radio waves. When you then start to realise that that sound and light are intertwined and that both actually contain messages, for argument's sake, the, the photons of the sun contain genetic information that communicates with human DNA. When you start looking at the root word of sun, which, which is sonic, so then we, we start to look at light and sound, and that is why you know the sun is so important to you know, the likes of, of, of Stonehenge that marked the spot where the sun would rise and uh, all, all of these, these planetary alignments and planetary things that are going on around the world. When you start looking at Silbury Hill, you know, it represents Earth and Mars, which is why there is so much connection between the planet Mars, Silbury Hill, around Stonehenge, around Avery. You know, Stonehenge represents the planet Saturn. Planet Saturn has a hexagon uh, on its North Pole. 
the hexagon is the symbol of wisdom, a uh, symbol of enlightenment. So we, we have all, again, we have all of these, these mysterious things going on in, in the ancient world. And when you start being able to, to put all these pieces together, if you imagine, you know, the detective movies where they're, the, the, the piecing all this, this together on this massive mosaic, you then start to see a pattern emerging. And as, as I was saying last week, when the same metaphors keep repeating, when the same words keep repeating, when the same number sequences keep repeating in all of these ancient cultures that we are told are completely individual with no connection to each other, you began to see that that's a complete fallacy and how these ancient cultures all had access to the same knowledge base. Now, if they all have access to the same knowledge base, they must have had some kind of connection or they must have had some point of contact that was making them all connect with the same database of information because it is really all about the sanctity of self and how we can raise ourselves to what the Egyptians called the God state, to what esoteric, esoteric Christianity is really the Christ consciousness. Now, Christ consciousness vibrates at 33 hertz, which is why the Bible tells us Christ died aged 33. We have 33 degrees of masonry, that the word Amen correlates to the number 33. We have 33 spins of DNA to complete a sequence of DNA. We even have NASA's launch pad with this X33. We have the Ku Klux Klan, KKK, 111111, is 33. Number 33 is a master number of power. So we have all of this numerology as well. You know, Christ was baptized age 30 because in numerology, the number 30 connects you to a higher place. It's that superior connection. When you see all these references to the number 40 in the Bible, you know, Jesus in the wilderness, Moses in the wilderness, yeah. it rained for 40 yeah. days and 40 nights. The number 40 has the power to yeah, lift you to a 40, as well, wasn't it? Yes. So, so again, it's all, it's all encoded messages. Mm. So, so the number 40 has the power to lift you to a spiritual state. It has the power to lift you to Moses. Now, Moses is a metaphor for the illuminated mind. Now, when we go, when Moses goes to the top of the mountain, a mountain, is a metaphor for a higher consciousness. So when Moses is at the top of the mountain and he comes across the burning bush, the burning bush is the pineal gland that is activated by the fire of Kundalini energy. It is the awakened mind. It is the illuminated mind. That is the Moses. And we have when, when we're looking when you start to analyse the Moses story, it all points to the same thing. You know where where the plagues of Egypt, where there was an argument with the Pharaoh. Now the Pharaoh is really a metaphor for ego. So we will have this battle. The, the illuminated mind will have this battle with the ego. But once the illuminated mind wins, that, that mind has been activated by what it says in the biblical story. The, the captors of Israel that were kept hostage in Egypt, which is really in the Kabbalah, it is the abyss, it is the lower chakras. Uh, Egypt is the lower chakras. Moses released them by the raising of the brazen serpent. That is the activation of the Kundalini serpent energy of fire, which then goes from the lower chakras, and by its fire, it destroys them. That is the, the, the burning of Sodom and Gomorrah. Sodom and Gomorrah are metaphors for the lower chakras. When we start looking at alchemy, and you start looking at the Bible, and you start looking at how Lot's wife turned into salt, mm. uh, when, when, when the body goes through what is known as alchemical ascension, the only thing that is left of the physical body is salt. Mm. That is telling you that it's going from, from, from the base level of metals up to the philosopher's stone, which is the gold of the crown chakra of enlightenment. That is why Lot's wife turned to salt. It's talking about alchemical ascension. So when, when you have this overall picture, you then start to see and, and, and you are able to then piece all this, this together to make one big picture. But that one big picture is all of the same landscape. And that landscape is really enlightenment and consciousness and how certain factors are able to raise that within us. Hmm. Yeah. I, the, 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 when you see a picture of the eye of Horus, isn't that the same type, the, the same thing as uh, the pineal gland? It seems to me when you see a picture side by side with it. Yeah, yes, it is. The, the pineal gland, uh, the eye of Horus is, is the pineal yeah, gland. I mean, yes. How would they have that knowledge back then uh, if it wasn't? 
actually that you know what I mean because they, they wouldn't have had any uh, idea of what, what what it was would they you know it's that's well well <laughs> remarkably they, they did because they they understood the brain you know when you look at the crown of the teeth mm. it is really the brain up and down the two hemispheres of the brain are up and down when when as I was saying last week when you look at the the great pyramid and you put an overlay of the human head facing north because the pineal gland is the north gate now when you put put a, an overlay of the human head you will see that it replicates and matches exactly where the free master glands of, of the third eye system are mm. now the third eye is known as the endocrine system endocrine means secretion within that secretion is white and brown, and that is why we have in the Bible the land of milk and honey. It's all relating to that consciousness wave, that consciousness awakening. So the Egyptians had a, a, an extremely advanced knowledge of DNA. They had an advanced knowledge of the brain. They had advanced knowledge of, of anatomy. They had advanced knowledge of how the brain connects to the universe. They had an advanced knowledge of star systems, that an advanced knowledge of subatomic particles. But then again, so did the writers of the Bible, who were the likes of the Pharisees, who had connections to the Kabbalah, who had connections to the Mishra schools of ancient Egypt, who then had connections to the Greek philosophers, who had connections to other civilizations around the world. So that, as I was saying, that they, they all had access to the same sacred database. So that, that, that shows some kind of, of point of connection. Yeah, indeed. Do you think the Vatican has got a lot of um, a lot of uh, documents stuffed away that were, people will probably never see, and they've probably got a lot, of, a lot of that knowledge buried? I would have thought, uh, and it just makes you wonder if um, the likes of the people in the Vatican actually do see that themselves. Do you, what do you think about that? Yeah, no, absolutely. Uh, again, you know, you have Pope Francis, who is the public face of the Vatican. Behind Pope Francis, you have the Black Pope, you have the Grey Pope, you have all of these Opus Dei, you, you have the Illuminati. Now, members of the Illuminati from America have actually contacted me and attempted to, to get me to join them. You know, pe people from the likes of the, the, the Order of the Golden Dawn have contacted me and said how accurate what I'm saying is. Mm. People from high, high Masonic degrees have contacted me and asked me to join them, all of which I've said now. But well, Why would you say they, no? They, they, is, uh, <laughs> is there any reason for why you'd say no? Because my philosophy is that information should not be secret. Oh, oh my, so, my so basically that, it was just to shut you up, basically. Is that, is that the kind of what, what you mean? I, I, th I think w w when they start seeing, seeing people, now, now bear in mind that when you, you look at the, the, the lower degrees of masonry and the, and the lower degrees of, you know, like the Bilderbergs, and mm. they are nurseries, and certain people are spotted in order to be taught a certain mm. way and, and sort of brought through the ranks to, to certain positions. Now, now, people, you know, in high politics and whatever, are, are put there by, by these people to, to actually forward a global agenda and, and sort of a global uh, politics. So I, th I think they, they, they sometimes spot things in people. You know, when, when you get talent scouts that go to, you know, like Hereford Town Football Club and, yeah. and things like that who, who, who work for Man United, they, they are talent spotting. And, and, you know, they're going back to the management team and saying, look, I've, I've just seen a striker here at, uh, at Hereford or, or Luton Town or, you know, I think, I think we should watch him. Uh, because I think, you know, when, when you start saying the, the, the things that I'm saying now to, to you and then the things that I'm saying to the audience who are listening are not meant to be known. They're not meant to be known by the people who are listening. Mm. They're not meant to be known mm. by you and they're not meant to be known by me. Now, for some reason, I, I know about them. And I've pieced them together. And the, the, the people who are being taught this in secret societies who are chosen initiates are telling me that it, it would take an initiate many, many years to have the same knowledge base that I'm telling now. Mm. Do you think there are so, others like you that might know that, that these exact same, well, not exact, maybe not these exact same things, but maybe um, similar uh, of similar teachings or? Of, of course there are. Uh, I, I mean, I've, I've come across, you know, quite a few that are coming across that, that, that they are, that they are speaking about the same salient points. They may have a different, a different sort of take on some of the things, mm. and I may have a different take on some of the things that they're saying. But nevertheless, you know, we may be on, on a different buzz or a different coach. But we're both talking about the same station. We end up at the same point, yeah, yeah. We end up at the same point, but, we, but, but, but there may be, you know, slight variations on how we're expressing it or how we're saying it. 
but nevertheless, you know, there are a number of people who are there. That I, I've not found anybody who's made the ancient connection like I have. I, I've, I've come across people who have made this connection to individual points. You know, some some people have made this connection to Stonehenge, but they've not made the connection to the Sidonian city, or they've not made that connection to the pyramids, or the Bible, or the Sumerian scrolls, or Atlantis. Now, even even the likes of King Arthur and Santa Claus and yeah, funny enough, I was, was going to mention King Arthur, but, but and uh, yeah, well, yeah, and and I was I was uh, you know it's all part of the same thing, you know, Santa Claus, King Arthur, Merlin. When we have the treasure map of pirates. It's all telling you of consciousness. Now, King Arthur is really, again, a metaphor for human consciousness. So when we look at the word Arthur, it, it comes from artos, which means bear. In spiritual meanings of animals, the bear is innermost thoughts, and a thought is a consciousness. It's teote. It is the master of thought. When we look at Avalon, it means the place of apples. It's like the apple of Garden of Eden. Now, if your your listeners wish to, to get an apple now, slice it widthways. Once you slice it widthways, it reveals the geometric shape of a pentagram. Now, a pentagram, the penta is the fifth element. It takes you above the four elements of physicality. It is all-knowing, all-seeing, all-wisdom, the pentagram. And that is that is the apple of the, the Garden of Eden. That is the apple of the Avalok of the King Arthur story. When he removes the sword, the sword is a metaphor for impenetrable knowledge. Now, Excalibur comes from ex cals libertarius, which means liberated from the stone. The stone is the foundation stone, which is the pineal gland. In other words, the metaphor of the story is only the chosen, only the selected can extract the knowledge and wisdom from the pineal gland. When it starts talking about Merlin, Merlin is talking about the inner alchemy, the inner philosopher's stone, the inner wizardry within us that, that is able to be activated to reach this God state, this Christed consciousness. When you start looking at Camelot, the castle of, of, of Arthur, that was said to have been built by the fire of the dragon. Now, the dragon, the serpent, the snake is wisdom. It is the Kundalini wisdom. It is the dragon rider. When, when these initiates actually master their lower self, they become the sons of the dragon which turns them into the Hierophant, turns them into the Hermetics. The Hermetics are those who understand sacred knowledge. They are able to interpret and understand sacred metaphors and sacred wisdom within shapes, within uh, sort of metaphors and symbols and codes. So the whole of the, the, the Arthur story, again, you know, when we look at Lancelot, Lancelot means godlike. Again, they are telling us about inner potential, our inner datism. That is the King Arthur story, and, and there's other facets to it as well. Mm. But again, in mm. essence, it's really talking about the inner awakening or the potential of inner awakening within us. So what about Merlin and Guinevere? I suppose it's... Um, or, Metaphors. That, they, they are sort of just additional. <laughs> and Galahad is another one, wasn't it? And Gawain. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. But but again, when, when you look, you know, some, some aspects of, of, of the Arthur story... It gives you the 12 nights of the round table. When, when you look at the, the chakra system, the chakra is basically an energy wheel. Now that wheel is the table. Now the word mensa means both mind and table. So when we see the, the likes of Christ at the table at the last supper, supper comes from soup, which is to enhance. It is enhance this Christ consciousness. In, in this place, in the temple of God, which is the, which is the head, which is the mind, you find, or Christ meets with the 12 disciples, which are the 12 cranial nerves, which are the 12 messengers of the brain that communicate to the rest of the body. That is the 12 nights of the King Arthur story of the round table. It's, it's basically, in, in a lot of respects, the, the only thing that has changed are the characters or the names of the characters. The message has always remained the same. And that message is part of the, of the ancient code, the ancient blueprint. So King Arthur is now different to Santa Claus, which is all about uh, the cognitive functions of the brain, the how, how that consciousness goes down the chimney, which is the top of the skull, goes all the way uh, down, down into, the, into, the, into the brain. It, it's all to do with consciousness. And when, when you look at the, the treasure, the likes of Treasure Island, which was actually written by Robert Louis Stevenson, who was a 
uh, theosophist. You know, he was part of the uh, Theosophical Societies. And what he what he's telling us, when you look at the likes of Treasure Island, and he, and he talks about Black Dot and, and things like that, the Black Dot is the Egyptian version of, of the Hindu Bindi, which is that, that circle that they put on their forehead, which marks the, the spot of the pineal gland. So that is really the atom in Egypt. That is the black dot. That is the black spot of Treasure Island. When you start looking at the, the gold, the treasure, the pieces of eight, the pieces of eight are the eight consciousnesses. And the treasure is the gold, which is the philosopher's stone, which is the alchemical ascension. When you start looking at X marks the spot, X is the optic chasism, which is where the Christ is crucified. It is the two bones of the, the skull and crossbones. It marks the spot. It marks where the treasure is. It marks where the, the illum- inner illumination is. When you look at the secret society, the skull and crossbones, and you see the number at the bottom, 322, and you see the skull, and you see the, the, the two bones crossing. Well, the two bones crossing again is the union, union of opposites and also the optic chasism. But there are 22 bones in the human skull. The human skull, the Galilee, the Galgotha, the uh, the walls of Jericho, uh, it's all the same thing. It's the human skull. But there are 22 bones in the skull. The skull, the head, is where we get the light to reach enlightenment. Now, the number 22 is on the third octave. That gives us the 322 of the, the skull and crossbones motif. It's talking about inner enlightenment, which is what these secret societies are teaching their initiates. Hmm. Well, wow, that's just blown me away. That. <laughs> that's, that's amazing. I bow down to your knowledge, Michael. I mean, that's amazing. It's, um, yeah, I'm, I'm actually just completely blown away with it. Um, <laughs> what can you tell us about um, the, the Sphinx, for instance? What, what, what are the meanings behind the, the way, the way it was shaped, the way it was? Or... Okay. Well, the, well, the, the Sphinx, uh, the lion, when you look at the, the, the priests of the mystery schools of Egypt, they were known as the lions. They were the holders of solar knowledge, solar consciousness. And the lion is associated with the sun. So when we when we approach the Sphinx, which again has high significance in geometry, and if you just remind me in a moment, I'll go into to the number 153, and that's really significant as well uh, as a master initiate. But when you approach the Sphinx, it is basically the Judah. Now, a Judah is a young lion. When you look at the Hebrew word, the, the, the word Judah connects you to two Hebrew words, which is Daleth and Dath. Daleth is doorway and Dath is knowledge. So when you go through the Sphinx, through the pores of the Sphinx into the subterranean chambers, you are entering the doorway of knowledge or the doorway to knowledge. You then start to become an initiate. You go through certain levels of initiation within mm-hmm. the pyramids. Now, geometrically, the pyramid is the most stable shape. It is a three-dimensional triangle, and triangle is is the shape of consciousness. So you have you have pyramidal neurons in the brain which deal with consciousness. They are pyramid shaped. When water reaches a point of consciousness, it becomes the shape of a tetrahedron. So the, so it's really uh, a symbol of consciousness. So you are really entering the guardian of knowledge. You are entering through the doorway of knowledge into the initiation chambers of the pyramid. Now. The, the, the number 153 in sacred geometry comes deeply into it as well. So 153, if you remember when Christ was resurrected, he assisted the disciples to catch 153 fish. Now the, the number 153 is the number of sacred knowledge, but also the master of the net, the master initiate. Now the, the, the net is really the flower of life. It is the, it is the geometry of everything in the universe. Now only the initiate that can understand geometry can navigate the net. The uninitiated will get stuck in that net. So 153, the 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 net, the master of the net, is as relevant to Christ. When you start looking at the Vesica Pisces, and you look at the the inner ring, the Vesica Pisces, which is a symbol of the yoni, the female genitalia, it has a ratio of 153. Now, when you start looking at Mary Magdalene, the the name Mary Magdalene, when you translate it into Greece. In Dramitia, which is the numerical value of letters and word, it equals 153. So therefore, it is the Christ of Sophia. Mary Magdalene is 153. It is the Yoni. It is the Vesica Pisces. When you start taking the 153 to Egypt and 
you go to the, the entrance of the Great Pyramid, it's on the 17th course level. Now, the significance of that is if you add up all the numbers from 1 to 17, 1 plus 2 plus 3 plus 4, all the way to 17, it equals 153. If you get if you get 17 and you times it by 9, the number of pyramids, it equals 153. When you go inside the Grand Gallery, it is 153 feet long. There are 153 steps. So we, we, we're talking about master initiate. We are talking about sacred knowledge that is written mathematically and geometrically within all of these monuments. So the Sphinx is the doorway to knowledge. It is the guardian of knowledge. It faces east, which again, in cardinal points, is the direction of illumination and enlightenment. Indeed, yeah, too much there to be coincidence, isn't there? It's, um... it, it's, uh, it's certainly not coincidence. I mean, it goes on and goes on and goes mm. on. Uh, so it, 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 it goes beyond the realms of any coincidence. Mm, that's fascinating. What about um, the connections between, uh, like, the Far East and then we go down to America, uh, the South South America, with the ancient uh, Aztecs and um, um, and their, their, their pyramids? Do you think there's any connections between the people that taught them and the people that taught the um, Egyptians? Uh, absolutely. There's, there's no difference. Uh, when you look at... If you if you get a map and you pinpoint every location of every pyramid on planet Earth, it, it's a star map. It becomes a star map. And again, it, they they all had access to the same knowledge base. Now, now the pyramid is consciousness. When you look at the Mayan pyramid in Tikal, as I was saying last week, you know mm. Tikal comes from Tika, which means pineal gland. That gives us Vatika, Vatika, Tika, the pineal gland, and that's why there's so many pine cone statues around Vatican City. It is no different, you know, South America, Quetzalcoatl, Kulkacan. Kulkacan, uh, I mean, uh, Quetzalcoatl means precious serpent. Kulkacan, it's, it's, it's alternative name, means the sacred serpent at the coccyx, which is the base of the spine. It's, it's Kundalini awakening. It's uh, it's no different, uh, regardless of the location on, on Earth, regardless of the shape of the monument, the message is the same. Uh, some, sometimes the characters have changed. The names of the characters have changed. You know, the Babylonian Semiramis is Isis. Uh, the Babylonian Nimrod is Horus. The, the characters, the, the names of them have changed, but the message and the metaphor remains the same. Hmm. Yeah, it's fascinating. I don't know if we... Uh, I mean, I'm interested in the stone tape theory. I don't know how you feel about that. You know, when we see ghosts or, or what we might perceive as aliens even... Um, like when stones recalled um, an ancient thing, and, and you might see a replay of it. Well, what you, do, do you think that's a possibility? In in well, well, so certainly crystalline stones do record information. They do transmit information, and you are able to communicate with stones. The same as you know when you look at the likes of the altar stone within Stonehenge, and people ask why is the altar stone off centre. It's off centre because the, the, the altar stone of Stonehenge is built directly above what is known as a yin aquifer, which is basically a holy well, which is Earth's waters. Now, Earth's waters, sacred waters, act as a tape recorder for information recorded at that ancient site. And that is why a lot of these ancient sites are not only built on uh, magnetic ley lines, because, again, magnetic energy uh, gives you a sort of a sound correlation. Uh, but it's also they're also built on yin aquifers, which is which is feminine earth water. So the, there are recording facilities now. The information stored in, in in earth waters can also be stored in in human waters. Now there are codes and languages stored in 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 the waters of the body, which are deciphered and encoded by hydrohaloric acids within us. The, the human body is a three billion letter code which is our DNA maker, which is our blueprint. Can stones record the past? Yes, they can. Uh, what are ghosts? Some people call it an Akashic record, but the universe has a memory. The, 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 the universe never forgets everything that happens. There, there is a fingerprint that is a remnant of everything somewhere that is never forgotten. And when you start looking at spirits, when you start looking at what it's like to be human, you know, do, do, do things end when, when the physical ends? No. Mm -hmm. uh, you know, that, that, that is proof in certain scientific uh, sectors that 
prove that is that is a soul that have recorded the weight of the soul as it leaves the human body upon death. You know that there are certain aspects of us that are simply energy. Now, energy, as a matter of physics, as a matter of science, as a matter of fact, cannot die. It can be changed. It can be it can be reshaped, but it cannot be extinguished. It cannot die. Mm. Now, bear in mind that the universe is energy, and bear in mind that everything that's created within the universe is also energy, including us. Now, if energy can't die and we are energy, there has to be a remnant of that aspect of ourself somewhere in, in, in the memory of the greater universe. And I do think that is, that is a viable argument to suggest that ghosts are a remnant, a conscious remnant of that former physicality. Mm. And, and I do think that they, they gravitate to a vibration where they're compatible and where they're comfortable. And I do think that would sort of scientifically answer what a ghost may be. I've had too many experiences of shadow people walking past, shadow people walking through walls in my house, uh, to, to realise that, you know, physicality is, is, is the only thing it, it isn't. And I, and I do think that, that the, the universe does have a memory. And I do think that the things that we sometimes catch a glimpse of, on, on a different frequency to our normal spectrum mm. are mm. in existence uh, and, and co- coexist alongside us. Because mm. quite often they don't seem to realise that uh, we are there either, do they? They, they seem to be uh, reenacting or continuing their life um, without even noticing us being there. But, and then you get other ghosts that will reenact, re- uh, will uh, react to uh, our presences. Uh, uh, well, I, well, I've certainly seen spirits of, of uh, famous historical characters, and as I've been looking at them, they've been looking at me. Now, now my my immediate thought is, what is what is he thinking? You know, am I a time traveller? Does he real? You know, mm. there's all the there's these thousands of thoughts going in my head in that split second. Well, if he's seeing so, you as a as a, as a uh, maybe as your 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 force, your life force, for instance, in a different being, maybe I don't know. Well, who, who knows? I mean, the the, the 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 only certainty is that he he he's actually seeing me mm. because we are looking in each other's eyes. So. He's seeing me and I'm seeing him and, and I know what I'm thinking and, but I'm thinking, what is he thinking? Yeah. You know, am I a time traveler? Am I, you know, I've seen, I've seen the spirits of, of animals of past, but I've just seen them as a ball of light. Oh. And, you know, uh, at the exact same time that I've seen them as a ball of light, independently, people who are, I've been with have actually seen them as, 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 as a spirit. So. I guess it depends on what death you've actually seen yeah, the, yeah. these entities as, as, as to what actually comes back to you. Yeah. I suppose it, it could boil down to the height of your psychic abilities, maybe even. I don't know. It's because uh, I think we've all got it in us, but I don't, I don't think I've got much of it because I don't really see much of anything. But you do get the, you do sense things. I mean, everyone gets these senses, don't they? Um, but I don't think everyone can see. I never see. I've never seen spirit, but I've experienced. Uh, I've experienced things. You know, it's um, it's quite a fascinating subject. Um, well, it is, and, and and you know very well when you know for for people who have never experienced anything, it, it, it's difficult to imagine anything you you have no yeah. experience of. But when you've experienced it, some sometimes words are inadequate. Yeah. You now, so some sometimes around the words aren't sufficient to describe what it you've is. It, it's so difficult but you, to you, you just know. Yeah, it's so difficult to describe something. I went on, I was at a ghost hunt just a couple of weeks ago, and I was seeing Meg like torches sitting with nobody touching them going on and going and coming off and going off you know, yeah and uh, there's no explanation for that apart from they they were being asked to from the other side you know and it's uh it, it's just weird <laughs> you know uh, well, well, it, well it is but you know and, and when when you've seen it and when you've experienced it when you when you've smelt it when you've mm. you've felt it you know that there is something else in existence even if you don't know what that is you know there's something else around yeah, you yeah indeed well, that, that could lead us on to reincarnation. What are your thoughts on reincarnation? Do do we come back sometimes, or? Well, there's there's lots of people, credible people that I've spoken to, that have told me that they've had past lives. Now that you know, there's 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 children who have been regressed, and they've they've, they've, they've taken you know the scientists and the people who are interviewing them to remote locations that are now longer inhabitable and and they've 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 mentioned things and patterns and stuff that are underground they're covered up 
Now, you know, how, how can they know unless they, unless they'd been there? You know, well, well, I've seen people coming back from out of body experience. I've seen people leave their body as part of an out of body experience. So if we have an aspect of ourself that can come and go and that can live on, why can't it come on and, and, and live on as something else, as another being, as another, as another person in the future? Indeed, yeah. Um, now, my, my opinion, having had now 10 years of constant daily experience of some kind, that anything is possible and anything is probable. Hmm. Um. Is it is there any sort of a, a primary factor that drive that drives you that keeps you motivated in your research and investigations? I think one to uh, I certainly have a, a burning desire to know and to learn and to piece things together and to actually understand things, to understand the world, to understand the great minds of the past, to understand why do people. Now celebrate the likes of Christmas. Why do we believe in, in stories? What, what are the true origins? Even as a young child of six and seven, you know, I was having sort of adult conversations with myself, feeling almost to the point of isolation because I felt different, mm-hmm. because I felt mm-hmm. I didn't belong. And, you know, I used to watch biblical films such as the Ten Commandments and, and sit there again at the age of six and seven and eight, you know, mm-hmm. Did, they, did these things really happen? Is there, was there a Moses? Is, is it possible scientifically for someone to be able to part the Red mm-hmm. Sea? And of course, now it didn't happen physically. It happened genetically. But having these these adult conversations at such a young age, I suppose it sort of built a foundation for, for that for that driving force for me wanting to know, to wanting to know the secrets, to want to, to put these secrets together. And again, importantly for me, you know, as I saw at Stonehenge yesterday, the the absolute delight and and and, and the absolute you know pleasure on 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 the faces of people who had such a great day, uh, being amongst these these this, this, these ancient secrets, this this ancient advanced knowledge, and that to me is, is a driving force from a personal point of view, but also from a, a point of view of people who want to know. You know, the, 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 I spent a lot of the 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 early years on, on, on this so-called path, trying to convince the world, but then you run out of energy very fast. Yeah. And then I start, you know, I start to realise through through error, through the hard way, you need to concentrate on the people who want to know, the people who come to you and say, you know, tell me, because then I have all the time in the world for, because they they want to know that there is no point trying to convince the world, you know, you just need to save your energy and help the people who, who, who want to know. Yeah. Is that how you see your role, to try and pass on as much knowledge as you can to everybody? It certainly is. Uh, and again, you know, uh, in, in, in 2010, uh, b- before I went to Egypt, uh, the, the, the wife and I were basically deciding where we wanted to go on holiday. And, and both sort of individually, we, we agreed that we... We wanted to go to Egypt, but we both, again, individually, realised that it was going to be more than just a, a holiday, more than just a vacation. That there was a, a deeper meaning. Now, a couple of weeks before we went, I had a strange email from a psychic medium who was based in Scotland, and she said that she had a, an important message from what did she described as a spiritual council. I can't remember who that. So it was made up of, but she did, she did actually tell us. But the message was, now bear in mind, you know, we, this, this was a vacation that had been decided for us, that the message was regarding your trip to Egypt, you will help uncover more insights and translate ancient knowledge brought to us from great distance. Under the Sphinx lies an ancient secret knowledge that will be added to your toolbox. Use this wisely for the benefit of all all meaning past, present and future. It all belongs together in the same place. She then concluded by saying, you must absorb, accept, understand and finally know. Only then can you share and teach. Now, it took seven years for that to come into fruition. Uh, But but that was a a, a cryptic message from a psychic medium a a few weeks before I went to Egypt in 2010. Wow. 
Hmm. Oh. And 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 this is uh, I mean I, I must add that this is uh, a psychic medium who I didn't know, who didn't know me, who was just made contact. Yeah. I've just remembered off air we were talking about you. You got a recording of a sound, haven't you? That so you wanted to play. Yeah, all, all it was uh, when when I again talk about the ancient stones, how they are amplifications and and transmitters of, of cryptic code within sound. That the when you go to the likes of Australia and you look at the Aborigines, they have a a piece of equipment which is simply uh, a piece of string with a, a piece of wood on the end, which they call a bora. Now, when they they turn that round in, in in circular fashion, it gives off a sound that they call the the voices of their ancestors. That sound has a frequency of 5.0 to 5.2 kilohertz, but it is the same sound that is found in crop circles, wow. which are also circular. Now, within crop circles, there have been found what are known as diatonic ratios. Now, diatonic ratios have an intelligence. They have an intelligent means of communication. Now, in the natural world, they are only found in the call of birds or, or the frequencies of whales, the sounds of the whale. They are an intelligent frequency that is not part of the natural world. Now, when you start looking at shapes and how certain shapes have sound, when you look at a snowflake and, and the beautiful geometry of a snowflake, that is really a picture of the sound of the surrounding environment. It is basically painting a picture of geometric sound. Now, the Greeks called geometry frozen music. Now, what has been found in various crop circles is an intelligent sound. Now, when you listen to it, uh, I think many people will come to the same conclusion as, as, as I have, is that it is a communication now when you go back to Stonehenge what I said earlier about the phonetic profiler which was capable of deciphering messages within sound waves and taking words and letters out of the frequency you will probably see Benny mind crop circles happen largely around the area of Stonehenge you will see that if you're able to decipher or take uh, extract words and letters from sonics you will be able to translate this into a language. Now, let, let me just listen to some uh, shapes of crop circles. There are a few. Different shapes of crop circles give you different sounds, but here's some of them. that are a number of them. Now, with, with each uh, different crop circle design, it gives you off a different sonic sound. Now, spirals are able to slow down the sound waves in order for that language, for that information to be interpreted at a slower pace. Now, when I heard that, now that has been digitally turned into a sound based on, on the shape the, the geometry of that crop circle. Now, that to me is the communication that I'm talking about in the likes of Stonehenge and the likes of other ancient monuments that are able to extract sound from letters from sound and create a language. Uh, and I think when you look at the likes of Nazca lines, which are pictorials, which give off the same kind of frequencies, the, the pictorials of the Nazca lines are a sound sonic language that is aiming to communicate. Stad, the likes of Stonehenge, is a giant enigma machine that is able to decipher, and the likes of crop circles are also giving us these sonic messages that, that at some point we will be able to decipher. But the ancient, the ancient wise ones, 
the ancient in tune ones were able to record and decipher communications from the stars. When you look at the likes of, you know, white horses on hills around Wiltshire and then around the world, a white horse is symbolic of a connection to a higher place and the hill is symbolic and a metaphor for a higher consciousness. We are being communicated by or with by beings that are not of this world, but they're, they've always been closely interlinked. Amazing, yeah. Wow. <laughs> well, those sounds are really weird, aren't they? It's uh, it's um, it's quite fast. Do you think all crop circles are genuine, or, or do you think there's a, a lot of fake ones out there? No, I, I do think there are fake ones. I, I do think that there are people that are doing them. Uh, so some people suggest that the people who are faking them are getting some kind of, of download, uh, which is giving them the, mm. the shape in their mind in, in which to form. But when you start looking at now, now I've been, I've been to crop circles, I've been inside crop circles, I've been uh, to to Wiltshire at the side of crop circles at night when it's completely pitch black, you can't see anything. I've seen night vision cameras set up all, all over the hills. I've seen live, uh, I've actually seen live on camera a crop circle being formed which was a, a gigantic flash of light, and then all of a sudden there was a, a pattern in the, in the harvest. There's, you know, there's, there's people who've seen uh, plasma balls around for, forming the shape. Now, plasma balls are basically uh, microwave energy, microwave heat, and certain people have actually found an intelligent communication between the, the between the plasma balls. That there is clearly something larger going yeah. on. I mean, to my mind, um, it, it's, it must be difficult to work in the pitch darkness to actually make out some of the uh, amazing shapes and, uh, and messages that have been uh, sort of put into the, these fields. I mean, how, how you do that in the pitch dark, I don't know, but, uh, you know. Well, you, you, you know, I mean, the, the thing is, it's not just a pattern, but it's also the, the sacred meaning and, and the sort of the esoteric, deep, yeah. hidden, encrypted meaning of that pattern. Now... I spoke to somebody a few months ago who, who was on social media saying, putting pictures of, of crop circles that he said that he and his friends had actually done. Now, I just messaged them and said, can you tell me how you encrypted diatonic ratios in your crop circles? And they couldn't answer me. So in other words, they didn't do it. No, it's weird. <laughs> yeah. Because there, there, there are diatonic ratios which are intelligent frequencies not of the natural mm. world that are encrypted within the pattern of the likes of crop circles and also the likes of the Nazca lines and all, all the pictorials that you see yeah. uh, at Nazca. Yeah, because I mean, it's not as if they're just in Wiltshire or, or, or the West Country, they're all over the world, aren't they, uh, crop circles? So at least you've got they, they the same, I mean, the same I mean, people flying around all over the world doing them. It's uh... Well, uh, uh, again, you know, it, it, it's that... It's that centre of knowledge base that, that is that are spread around the world. Now that, that that proves to me some kind of connection between all of these remote cultures, you know, who who are meant to have had no connection. Mm. So it it is it is this, this this database of knowledge, this database of of deep, hidden, encrypted universal knowledge. You know, when you when you look at geometry, geometry stimulates both hemispheres of the brain. Now when you ha you when you stimulate both hemispheres of the brain and, and inside the king's chamber you know you have you have frequency inside the king's chamber that does the same when you synchronize the two hemispheres of the brain it enables you to connect to the universal greater knowledge so they're either doing that or they were being they, they were being given this knowledge yeah. now i think they've mm -hmm. been given this knowledge and taught how to use it and how to implement yeah, it made, and i think that's a tool sort of thing yeah yeah and I, I think they were using structures that were here before they were, but they were being taught how to use them. You know, if, if you pick up a, a modern gay guitar or trumpet or saxophone, unless somebody tells you how to play it, you're not, you're not going to know what yeah, to do. Me. Yeah. So <laughs> I, I think, well, yeah, and, and me too. And, but, but I think if, if you have the teacher who teaches you how to make the sound, who teaches you how to make chords, notes, how to harmonize, how to tune up that instrument, that is really what what is happening with these monoliths. They are a, a, a gigantic tuning force for frequency communication. Mm. Well, yeah, it's a lot, a lot, a lot to think about there. Uh, have you had any disappointments in the in your um, researches, or, or you know, is there anything you've been disappointed with? 
I don't necessarily think disappointed. I think, I think, no, I'm very, I feel very honoured. I feel very privileged. I feel very full of glee to actually, to actually know and, and to be able to get into the minds of, of, of the people who knew. Mm. And with, with each day, there is another piece of information that really enhances what I knew the day before. Mm. And, and, you know, the day after that, will be the same and the day after that will be the same yeah. again. So it's it's not a it's not a disappointment because everything which whichever whichever direction I, 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 I go, whichever angle I go at this information and I do, you know, again being being seventeen years of law enforcement, you don't just see something and, and just jump to a conclusion. That that is a that is a analytical process that that rules everything out before you come to that conclusion. Whichever angle that I that I'm coming at this from it's all pointing me to the same place. And, and, and as I've said a few times, when you have the same words, when you have the same meanings, the same metaphors, the same letters, the same numbers, the same sequences coming up time and time again from different places all over the world. In fact, every single ancient civilization of the world that is known to us, those metaphors, those encrypted messages, those numbers, those sequences are all repeated mm. time and time again. <laughs> That to me is worth sitting up and taking notes because there's there's, there's a message there, there's a connection yeah, there. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, have you ever set off on a, what I was trying to get, get at? I think with the disappointments. I mean, have you ever set off on a path thinking it was going to lead you to an answer, and then you find that it, you didn't get the answer that you expected? Or I've certainly set on I've set on off on a path looking for information. I've been diverted to other places. But I found information that has taken me to the to, to the place I was looking in the first mm -hmm. place. So it's sort of a detour. You know, I mean, once uh, I actually read a, an academic science paper for probably three and a half to four hours, and I was looking for some information. And at the end of that, in the last couple of paragraphs, there was two words that I've been looking for that 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 scientifically proved what I was what I was looking into. So. I suppose it's not a disappointment, but sometimes it doesn't come easy. It can it can take a lot of time and it can take a lot of effort. Mm. You know, some some sometimes when uh, I'm asleep, I will get mathematical sequences. Uh, the 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 last one I got was a little while ago when I, it, it, it was so so prominent that it that it was something that that I remembered. I don't normally remember dreams or or anything like that, but this was so prominent, and all it was was the the symbol of a square root and the numbers nine three seven now when i looked at and it took me literally half a day and a splitting headache and to actually look into the the real deeper meaning of the square root of nine three seven and what it really means it comes all the way back to the hexagram which is the ascent that represents the ascent towards the egyptian godhead and it's a terminology for enlightened consciousness, and it represents uh, insight and wisdom and magic power within, and also unity hive consciousness. And it also goes back to Egyptian royalty. So that that that, that was given to me as a square root of nine three seven. It's taken me all the way around to what is now the star numbers, uh, which is central figure at numbers that represent a centered hexagram. That has then taken me to Egyptian godhead to wisdom to magic to Egyptian royalty. So that square root of nine three seven given to me simply in that form has taken me all the way back basically to the, the mystery schools of Egypt. Oh. That's that sort of that square root has brought us almost full circle back to where we started, where we started isn't it? It's not it's well, it not has... often you dream about square square roots, is it? <laughs> well no, I mean as I say so I mean it's not very no. often and unless it's unless unless it's a specific reason. I don't remember many dreams. I don't remember many things that happen. I, I just go into this abyss and, and, and don't tend to remember mm. anything. But when it is so prominent, when it's so important, then I will wake up and I'll remember yeah. it. But, you know, if you just imagine waking it up and, and, and all you can see in your mind and all you can think about is the square root of 937 yeah. <laughs> because that, that is all you yeah. have. <laughs> and, you know, you spend, you spend half a day working out why you've just been given a mathematical sequence. Yeah, because obviously that, those paths you've set off, you've probably been surprised by the results you found with all the uh, connecting numbers and everything. That's, uh, 
by the sound of it. It is. Uh, it, it is. It, it is more of a surprise than uh, as I say, any, any disappointment. I do sometimes go off on one path, but get diverted to another path. But invariably, whichever path that I will go in, in whatever direction I go in, it will always lead back to the same place, yeah. and it will always lead back to the same ancient code and the, the same ancient blueprint that is not only used in the ancients but it's come through the secret societies and the secret brotherhoods and the ecclesiastical brotherhoods and it's it's prominent but hidden within modern day society as well yeah, it's, oh, you've actually blown my mind mike it's um I'm, i've got i'm gonna have to get all your books now <laughs> and uh really fill my mind with it because it's been fantastic i mean uh, let's, let's just give your your books a mention uh, is there any I, I presume you can get them all on amazon is there any other places you get them or you can get you can get them all on amazon uh, whether europe uk or, or america you yeah. can get them from a website which is www.michael-feely.com uh, there's lots of free blogs on there as well with this kind of information there's a free newsletter that people can sign up and get weekly newsletters right. uh, so so that, that's really probably the epicenter of everything uh, I'm, I'm also on you know social media and facebook and linkedin and and other places like that as well. I'm glad I found you. <laughs> but, um, yeah, it's been fascinating. I mean, I'll, I'll, what I'll do, I've got, as, you, as I mentioned, I've got a Paranormal Dimensions page. If anyone would like to, men uh, to visit, I'll put all, a lot of um, Michael's books on there and, and uh, I'll put links to um, his web page and everything and I'll try and give you as much information as I can. I'll pinch a few pictures off you, Michael, if I may, to put on there for you. Yeah, they do. <laughs> and, um, yeah, but it's been absolutely it. fascinating. <laughs> you know, I, I really love talking to you and... Uh, Maybe we can get you back on again sometime. Have you got any more books coming out? Or um... I've certainly got uh, there's certainly one in, in the pipeline. Uh, I, I don't know when that's going to be because when I, when I when I write a book, literally within a couple of months, it becomes sort of old news. Really, it, it, it's developing that oh. fast. Uh, I think the next one that I, that, that I'm thinking of doing is, is called you know the, the real identity of Christ. Uh, Secrets of the Caldex Vaticanus, which really goes deep into sort of religious meanings and, and, and characters and stories and, and, and what they really mean. But it also, again, will, will touch on deeply how these kind of meanings have also come back from, from the ancient uh, cultures as well, because it is all all interlinked and not a separate subject. But I've, I've also got lots of things. I'm, I've started Stonehenge uh, recently with a group. Uh, I'm, I'm also going to be doing soon some cathedral visits as well, taking people around certain cathedrals around the UK, which I do have permission to do now, having contacted them. Uh, mm -hmm. And I'll certainly be pointing out lots and lots of deep esoteric meanings within, you know, the actual buildings and, and within religion yeah. itself. And it may even yeah. extend to the likes of Easter Island and Egypt. Uh, I'm doing quite a few talks around the UK this yeah, year as well, so oh, there's, there's, there's a lot going yeah, on. Yeah, well, I hope to actually meet up with you, Michael, at some point. Um, hopefully, if you come to my area, I mean, you're always welcome to my home here. Have a come around a cup of coffee. <laughs> but uh, um, thank you. <laughs> that's right. No, I mean, I really do hope to meet up with you sometime. I mean, you've actually got a book out called uh, Stonehenge: The Secret of the Monoliths. If anyone's interested in continuing with that. Uh, there's several other books, but I will put them all on the site anyway. Um, but I'm afraid I've come, I've got to leave it there now, Michael. And it's been fantastic speaking to you, and uh, you've been a fantastic guest, and uh, you filled my head with numbers and figures and pictures and God knows what else. <laughs> and then I'm actually amazed. And thank you for that. And um, no, for, thank you again. It's, it's it, I, I love speaking about this. I love giving the information to other people and. It's people like yourself that provide the platform for me to do that. So, again, it's a, it's a mutual yeah. thank you uh, and, and, and a genuine It's one. been my pleasure, Mark. Well, thank you very much for, for coming on again. And um, hopefully, we've, as I say, we'll get you back on again. Um, right, we're there. I've got, I'm afraid you, I've got to say uh, goodbye. <laughs> Thanks again, Michael. Goodbye to you. Thank you. Thank you. You take care. Thank Thanks you. again. And thank you for everyone out there for listening again. Uh, as I'm sure you'll agree, Michael's been fantastic, and um, I, I, I will put a lot of information on the site, as I say, for uh, Michael's books. And um, I'm afraid I've got to leave it there and go. Bye bye.